Okay, we are back and we're going to move on to session two, uh, need for research in advanced technologies to support genomic medicine. Our co-moderators for this session are Carol Bolt. Uh, Dr. Bolt is a professor and Knowlton uh, family chair at the Jackson Laboratory Mammal Mammalian Genetics uh, Center in uh, Bar Harbor. Uh, she maintains the Mouse Genome Informatics Database and is also the PI of the Alliance of Gen uh, Genome Resources. Uh, our other moderator is uh, Jim uh, Semino. Uh, Jim um, is professor in computer science and a professor of medicine and uh, director of the uh, University of Alabama Birmingham's Informatics Institute. For those of you who are of the NIH persuasion, you'll uh, recognize Jim for his many years of service as the chief of laboratory informatics uh, and development uh, at uh, the National Library of Medicine and the NIH Clinical Center. So Carol and Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, so I think I'm just gonna uh, jump in with some short introductions of our speakers and uh, something maybe add a few things that are not in the handout. Uh, first is uh, Gil Alterovitz. Uh, he's a uh, PhD. Um, in electrical engineering and biomedical engineering. Uh, he is a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, a fellow of the American Medical Informatics Association, uh, currently director of biomedical cybernetics lab and professor at Harvard Medical School. Also relevant here, he's co-chair of HL7's clinical genomics working group. Uh, and he, is, uh, he works uh, in uh, precision medicine and uh, uh, genomic machine learning. Uh, second, we have um, Lisa, and I asked her how to pronounce her name, so I'm going to mangle it. Lisa Besterach. Besterach. Uh, Besterach, thank you. Uh, it's, she's an assistant professor of biomedical informatics at Vanderbilt uh, and the Center for, um, I'm going to have to point my glasses on here, Center for Precision Medicine. She has a master's of science from the University of Chicago in linguistic anthropology. Uh, she develops and implements new FIWAS and phenotyping methods and most recently is published on uh, phenotyping methods for COVID-19. And uh, she is, uh, her area of research is using EHRs to find cohorts and phenotypes. And then last but not least, Kevin Johnson. I'm here somewhere, sorry. So Kevin, he is uh, an MD from Hopkins. He also has a master's in biomedical informatics from Stanford. Also a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. He's known for researching and evaluating clinical information systems to improve patient safety and physician adoption. He has a very well-known podcast called Informatics in the Round. I, I uh, highly recommend you check it out. Uh, and he's also the director and producer of the award-winning film, No Matter Where, on electronic health records, uh, one of the few informatic informaticians with a um, IMDb webpage. Okay, so we're gonna start with uh, Gil. All right, yeah, thanks, uh, Jim, for that uh, introduction. And uh, I, I really have enjoyed the uh, talk so far, um, so it's been really great. Um, so I was asked to talk about intelligence automation at its finest. Uh, how to use genomic-based uh, clinical informatics to change the clinical culture that supports genomics. Um, so uh, let's get started. Um, so I think uh, many of you may have seen this already, uh, but just want to point out that uh, there are a number of different uh, genomics use cases that uh, can leverage um, artificial intelligence and automation and um, it, they, that has been uh, put together in the uh, HL7 domain analysis model document for clinical genomics that was uh, published. Um, so that may be a good place for those who are kind of interested in kind of getting started. Uh, but what I wanted to do today is really talk about kind of how the field is moving forward in a number, in a number of different ways um, and kind of take you through a little story on that and, and kind of seeing where uh, things are, are uh, kind of moving and what are kind of some of the ideas on, on that front. So, you know, when we look previously and, and previously I say, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, four or five, five years ago, there were really no or there were really little, uh, you know, defined or uh, accepted 
uh, standards. Um, there, there were, you know, a few kind of different efforts here and there. Um, and then there was this need, uh, you know, to try out standards, to pilot, to define the standards. Um, and the good news is that uh, that has been done. Um, you know, that has been uh, successful. There are now uh, standards in a number of these uh, different areas. We've learned a lot from the piloting. Um, and uh, there's a number of things that, you know, have been developed to make things uh, patient centric. Um, so that's the, the good news. The uh, maybe the not so good news or the, the other aspect is that, you know, there's only so much we can learn from, from piloting. There's only so much, you know, we can uh, continue, of course, to refine standards and so forth. Uh, but there's really a need uh, to take the next step. Um, and that's, you know, in, in just tracing and thinking about, you know, the areas that we've worked on and, and are now focusing on, <clears throat> it really got me to thinking about this. What are some of the steps that we're working on that others um, that we're collaborating with are doing uh, that can really help us take the next step. Um, so really scalability is really an important key here uh, as opposed to uh, piloting in kind of like small uh, circumstances, uh, a scalable workflow uh, and process solutions. Those are really um, the areas that are uh, need development now. Um, it is uh, you know at the interface of research and development and, and practice. Um, and there's the need for interconnected applications, uh, modules and interfaces. Whereas in the past, a lot of the work has been on kind of individual, you know, one application here, there, uh, working with different types of data, sometimes different standards, uh, different versions of standards. Uh, you know, now there's this need, um, and that's kind of the next step is this interconnected framework. Um, there's a need for AIable, or some people call it AI ready, and uh, researchable or research ready uh, genomic medicine, um, essentially the merging of clinical lab as well as the provenance so that you can uh, have the research capabilities um, from information derived at point of care. So essentially thinking about uh, research uh, from the beginning. Um, I've seen this in a number of different areas. It, it can be as simple as, you know, thinking about how to do the consent forms and, thing, and things like that at the very beginning. Um, all the way to uh, the next thing is kind of a networked ecosystem. So all these different uh, pieces working together. Um, and now that there are these uh, different standards and there are, you know, the pilots you know, have been done and, and, and a number of different uh, pieces have, have been of the puzzle have been put together. Uh, there are different organizations that are at different levels of adoption. And so uh, understanding that, promoting and understanding and evaluating those levels so that we can have an interconnected networked uh, ecosystem is an important area uh, that we've been working on. Um, and then finally, in addition to uh, the standards around how the data that's communicated, there's a need to really uh, work around um, the authorization, authentication, security, and privacy uh, concerns. So for example, uh, privacy preserving AI on uh, clinical genomic data. Um, so you can actually, so you can process the data without actually seeing the underlying data and, and create modules for that. Uh, smart contracts, talk a little bit about that in a little bit. It doesn't have to be uh, via blockchain or anything like that, but uh, this idea of empowering the patient to be able to make these decisions uh, and, uh, and then finally, the, the idea of promoting diversity. We heard about that from uh, Dr. Green earlier, and uh, that's an important uh, note as well. And so we've been uh, working on um, this uh, consortium to bring together a number of uh, organizations around uh, these themes of, of kind of the next steps that we need to create a scalable uh, infrastructure that has these different properties. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll do a kind of quick review of some of the some of the aspects that have uh, gotten us to this point and kind of what some of the, how the next steps can, can kind of um, kind of enhance some of this work. So uh, this just shows an example of a, kind of a patient centric app, which uh, looked at chronic uh, diabetes uh, condition. Um, and uh, in this case, this particular one, juvenile diabetes uh, would involve a, a patient, and it could be a child, who may uh, relate more to an avatar. There's actually a physical uh, stuffed animal that relates to this uh, in this application. Uh, information that the physician uh, can, can see and present, as well as information uh, from patient-generated uh, data 
uh, and their caregiver. That's all presented together in one screen uh, and in, in, embodies with it a uh, genomics module, uh, which is standardized so that it can fit into different types of applications. Uh, so, you know, kind of an early example of kind of this uh, uh, idea of the interconnected uh, apps and, and modules working together. Uh, so you would only have to write the uh, module one time and it can work for different different diseases. Um, another one um, is uh, the smart precision cancer um, uh, medicine or uh, navigator example, uh, which was done in uh, collaboration with uh, Vanderbilt um, and a number of uh, interested parties now in uh, taking that to uh, the next steps. Um, you know, just as a little thing on, on that one, it basically allows for different views uh, of you as a patient compared to all the other patients in a view that a physician and a patient can go over the data uh, together. Um, next up, just to show another example of um, is the idea of taking um, policies, uh, implementing different policies of different organizations. So ASCO, which uh, focuses on, um, you know, on, on, on cancer oncology area, made a series of recommendations on enabling precision cancer medicine. And um, this application, uh, which we uh, put together, basically implemented those rec recommendations and securely links patient-specific data from the EHRs through FHIR and multiple uh, knowledge bases uh, for information and treatment options so that the patient and the physician uh, together uh, can go over um, the data for that patient uh, and decide on, on, on next steps uh, for them. Uh, just a, an example of a more recent one, uh, the COVID navigator uh, about empowering patients uh, it enables over 50 million patients to uh, look at and, and kind of have uh, a look at personalized uh, COVID-19 risk factors, takes the latest papers that are out there uh, and shows them uh, about their condition in a relation to those other, uh, to the to mo the most recent literature out there uh, when they log in. Um, and just to show you, you know, kind of how this ecosystem is being developed, there are a number of different applications, you know, everything from when you're ordering uh, genomic tests all the way to uh, reporting, viewing the results at point of care. There's uh, integration of information from the medical record, information from genomics data, which may be uh, off-site, maybe at a different location. Um, and uh, that ability and, and defining those uh, process and workflows um, is really uh, what's uh, kind of the, the steps that are going on now. In the past, it would be around maybe, you know, we'd work on piloting one of these or, um, you know, and, and having them work in isolation. And now it's about having all the different pieces uh, working together. And so, um, you know, this kind of shows the, the change in, in how some of uh, this has been going on um, in terms of, you know, defining some of the standard use cases that's been done. You know, of course, it'll evolve over time. And, um, you know, as, as new people and, and new uh, organizations, you know, uh, discover and, and develop new use cases and, you know, different documents will be enhanced over time, I'm sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, the actually using different standards, you know, just kind of in, in this case, mentioning FHIR here, uh, where, you know, there can be uh, connected thons kind of at the local level, different pilots, uh, and now really getting over into production and getting these things uh, used to make a difference for patients. Um, and so the next thing is like, how do you, once things are, and we are seeing already a few of these going into production, how do you evaluate the different level? Uh, because not everyone adopts all the different standards or all of a particular standard at the same time. And so you wanna make sure that these systems can uh, communicate together. Because often we see patients, uh, you know, with data in different, different uh, locations, uh, genomic data, or can also be in uh, different locations. So how do you make sure these systems uh, communicate together? Um, and so really the, the notion going forward is toward to enable uh, this uh, essentially decision-making uh, is that really we need to build toward an ecosystem. So rather than thinking about things as point to point, which has often been uh, the case in the past with these uh, apps and applications, um, really it's, it's more about a, a uh, an interconnected ecosystem. And there are gonna be different levels of information available from each of these. There are different speeds of adoption. Um, there's a need to really communicate between these multiple, par multiple parties that may adopt different 
uh, different uh, parts of the standard, different versions and so forth. Um, and uh, so how, how did it go about doing that? Um, and then the other piece is around empowering the individuals I mentioned. And so uh, individuals uh, a priori can decide what it is that they would like to make available uh, to both themselves, relatives, others, uh, through smart contracts that may also evolve and, and change over time. Uh, the notion of smart contracts has traditionally been associated with blockchain, but it doesn't really have to be. Um, and, um, and, and the idea is that um, by empowering uh, the patient and to make a, uh, a decision about their, uh, about their data, that can be uh, shared with them and with others as they'd want to learn about it. So just as an example, they may not want to know that they have a certain uh, genetic condition. So they may actually uh, prevent themselves from knowing a, want to prevent themselves from knowing a certain piece of information uh, you know, in the future, if there's a particular disease or something that they may not want to know about, like Alzheimer's or something else. Um, so, you know, that's the idea. There are smart contracts. Um, and then just wanted to make sure to leave uh, if there are any uh, points of any, any questions or any thoughts, and especially eager to explore um, any of these ideas that we're, um, we're now um, looking at and, and combining with a number of different parties. So I'll stop. Bill, thanks. You're right on time. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, I see there's two Q and A, but they're from the previous session, I believe. Oh, okay. Free to answer them if you want. But <laughs> and give people a little another chance to type. So Gil, I was interested in your COVID example. Yes. Um, and it looked like uh, it, cool. you were presenting to individuals like research papers related to different risk factors. So how do you measure the impact of that kind of access on behavior or outcomes? Right, right. So. Uh, in, in this case, so that, that would be basically the next step. Uh, this is an application we just uh, finished uh, recently uh, where we've integrated actually a few more. This is just one of like probably 10 screenshots of other things that, that can be done here. Um, so uh, the idea is to first learn and develop a way to assess what kind of impact this would have, right? Both on the patients and on the physicians of knowing these pieces of information. Does it lead to a different uh, actionable decision? You know, maybe they learn about uh, how, um, because basically it combines all their conditions together and then looks for relevant new papers and new findings that may have come up related to that in COVID because COVID is really a you know, rapidly changing field. Same with variants and things like that, right? So. Um, and, um, and so the, the thinking is that now that this application is, is, uh, is done, uh, working together um, both through focus groups and then um, through um, kind of a, basically an IRB based study, we would uh, get, we would see, we would kind of record and ask them to see if there were changes made in care uh, based on, on uh, this or if this affected the way that they um, did the standardized processes for uh, triaging patients and so forth. I, I will mention that um, not this application, another one that I'm not showing here, it was kind of interesting that it was developed uh, for artificial intelligence to, uh, to look at um, prognostics information for the, the COVID patient. And, and we thought it was going to be used for one purpose, but actually ended up being used for a different purpose. And so uh, that was really interesting that we then, uh, you know, are now changing the type of questionnaires that we're giving to the physicians because it ended up that they're using it more for palliative care decisions uh, and when to do that timing uh, rather than uh, resource allocation, which was the original thinking with beds and things like that. So there's a question um, about yeah. whether the COVID-19 navigator is in Spanish or other languages. 
Well, that's a great question. Um, and currently, it, you know, it was just completed in uh, these, some of these screenshots are uh, just a couple of weeks old uh, in English. We will definitely, um, that will be um, an item that I'm gonna put on the, the feature list. Uh, we had looked at, um, at uh, Chinese, uh, but um, just in that, um, when we were first designing this, it was, um, you know, it was in, in China and there were a number of things there that we wanted to see if, if you know, if that might be a potential collaboration. Uh, but I think it would be useful to have it in a number of different languages because once we do, uh, but right now it's only in English, just to point that out. Yeah. Right. Um, let's see. And it seems a you know, key important consideration. Yes, yeah, and, and as was mentioned, that was in, in one of the priority items that we had mentioned was promoting uh, promoting diversity. So that um, and it, yeah, so that's uh, of course going to be uh, one of the uh, languages that when we do add uh, support, we're gonna we're gonna have that. Uh, one of the features that we're we've been working on right now is. Uh, adding in a couple of new databases that are going to be updated around different uh, drug regimens and things like that. But um, yeah, so thank you. Okay, uh, we need to move on to the next speaker. Uh, Lisa, do you have slides? Do. Uh, there were a few uh, questions in the chat and I'm gonna save those for the discussion. Um, so if you asked a question that didn't get addressed, we'll come back to that. Great. Hi, I'm Lisa Bastaresh. I'm a faculty member at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And today I want to make a case for how what we can do using clinical genetic test results for both research and to improve patient care. Um, I was really happy to see Casey Overby Taylor present some recent progress in getting EHR data into machine readable format integrated with um, the electronic health record. But I can say from experience that over the last 20 years, we have not had a real streamlined process to do this. I think I'll show some examples to demonstrate that. Nevertheless, I think that this data is so valuable that it is worth the pain of trying to find the, this information because I think it can really advance the field in a lot of different ways. And I'll start with a particular example. This comes from the Undiagnosed Disease Network. Um, the UDN sees patients who have mysterious medical conditions with no underlying explanation, and this patient was no different. She was a 26-year-old female who had multiple medical problems, and including autism, some learning disability, and hypermobility. Um, she was sequenced, and there was a really appealing candidate variant that came up in a gene called MSL2. The variant was de novo and frame shift, super rare. Um, the problem was that this was not a known disease-causing gene. This kind of thing comes up all the time and whole exome sequence. Um, the UDN team was able to find a research paper linking MSL2 to autism, but it left a big question mark around these other phenotypes that the patient had. So we were at an impasse at this point. Or were we? What if we had seen another MSL2 patient at Vanderbilt at some point? Sure, we asked the people at the UDN if they'd ever remembered an example, and they run the genetics clinic, and they couldn't think of one off the top of their head. But as you guys all know, a lot of people are doing exome sequencing at this point, not just people in genetics clinic, but also in neurology. Um, and so we felt this was a worth, a, it was a shot in the dark, but it was worth a shot. One thing that's nice about gene names is that they tend to be named by unique combinations of letters and numbers that don't come up in regular conversation. Um, so because of that, we can just do a string search on a bunch of different medical records for, to look for these gene mentions. Um, when we did this on over 3 million patients that we have in a database of electronic health records at Vanderbilt, we came up with only two matches. And a quick perusal of those matches showed that we had two additional patients who'd gotten whole exome sequence at Vanderbilt and had de novo mutations in MSL2. Um, we sent this record to Ellie Brokamp, who is a really talented genetic counselor and researcher who works at the UDN. And when she looked at those records, she found that the patients had really striking overlap phenotypically with our proband. This was enough information for the UDN to consider this to be basically a solved case, and the information was relayed to the patient and her family. So I got to tell you, this was super exciting to me because I'm a programmer. I don't get to do this kind of stuff very often. And um, so this raised the question though, is this the only situation that we have that we're sitting on here? You know, Might we have more people who are UDN cases or even just patients at Vanderbilt where we could just put two and two together with data that we're just sitting on in the electronic health record? 
Now, in order to systematically address this question, what we would love to have is a clinical genetic database with all of the information, who was tested, what genes were found, all curated nicely, so we could just do some queries, right? But that is not what we have in reality. In reality, for the past couple of decades, most genetic information has come in through the medical record as PDF reports, which are scanned as an image into the medical record, which doctors can see, but me as a researcher with a research database, I cannot see it and I cannot search it. The saving grace here, and the reason we were able to find the MSL2 variants is that a lot of times this information is actually hand keyed into text notes, at least at Vanderbilt. I can't speak for other institutions at this point. Um, and so that's why we were able to reveal these two patients with the search. So this kind of spurred a large ongoing and I admit potentially quixotic effort to index the medical record with all genetic findings in the last 20 years. And one thing that we've observed in this process so far is that if you ask where do these genetic findings end up in the EHR, they end up all over the place in all different kinds of notes. About half of the notes actually are structured or quasi-structured. So they come in the form of things like micro, chromosomal microarrays, which are done in-house at Vanderbilt. And they have a kind of you know, standard reporting system for those. Um, we can write quick little parsers um, to extract that information automatically. There are also a lot of genetic data that comes through genetic clinics. And because they have such high volume of this stuff, they, many of them, and I'll you know, name check Georgia Wisner, who's done a fantastic job with this in the hereditary cancer clinic, have come up with kind of templated ways of mentioning these results in the medical record. But we've also identified just this huge bolus of data that is just hanging out in different notes. Your endocrinologist, your primary care doc, some in clinical communications and problem lists. In this case, the problem is a lot harder because the fact of the matter is genes and even specific variants are mentioned a lot of times in contexts which don't pertain directly to the patient. There are a variant that was found in their paternal aunt. It's a variant that was found in their, in their tumor. It's the variant they may have if ever we get around to testing or get insurance to pay for testing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have to say it's a little embarrassing, but I've taken a crack at this problem and my background's in NLP and I have not been able to come up with a fully automated way of extracting this information from the medical record without the complement of some sort of manual review at the, at the end of it. Um, I've actually over a year working on this problem come up with I think it's the accurate visual representation of the of the process in the last 20 years of adding EHR um, genetic data into the EHR. If you imagine the EHR as a car and you imagine the genetic data wa as water, it sort of looks like this. This goes all over the place. Some of it lands on the car, some of it doesn't. So it is a mess. Okay. But even though this has given me huge trouble and I probably wouldn't have even started this if I knew how much trouble it was gonna be, I still love clinical genetic variants and I think you should too. And here are some of the reasons. Number one, they are free. Even though as Eric pointed out, the cost of sequencing has going down, research sequences are not free, even though I love those too. Secondly, there's more of this data every single day. This is a, um, a chart showing the number of patients, not just with tests, but with actual findings mentioned in their medical record that we have so far curated in our database. Um, and you can see that it grows each year. Number three, they are consequential variants. Um, this is a, is a boon and a bane, but you can see that there's a major bias towards pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants if we look at those that are mentioned in the medical record. These are the variants that even though that are most likely to impact patients' care and their life and their health. Um, and so this brings up a lot of interesting research opportunities to use this type of information to further characterize these patients. And I'll also say along these lines, um, as a data scientist and a non-MD, I really love working with this data because I feel like it puts me closer to the action, you know? Clinical genetic testing is a way that every single day people are getting diagnoses and getting better treatment as a result of this process. And so I think it helps me put it, myself into a mindset of how do we build on the foundation of this process? And as a data scientist, there are ways that I can enhance it and make it better. Another reason I love them is I think that it can help us by having a database like this, take a fresh perspective on some um, data that is often looked at in a different context. So typically genetic testing results are looked at in the context of a patient or their family. But if you start aggregating up this data, you can start seeing that at the population level, broad patterns, and this is just a toy example of prototypes that we're putting together based on this database of the percentage of patients who have breast cancer with genetic pathogenic variants that 
um, are related to their breast cancer and how that has changed over time. Ooh, and you can also look at what kind of genes are underlying that molecular diagnosis for these patients. Um, another point, and this pertains to something that Janina Jeff pointed out um, earlier in her wonderful talk, is I think that we can, if we aggregate this data together, I think we can monitor this super important issue of, of disparity um, based on genetic ancestry. As we all know, patients who are of African ancestry are much more likely to get a VUS than those who are of European ancestry. Um, but this is not a static problem, and it's certainly not an inevitability. There are things we can do about it. Um, using EHR data in a project that I'm working on with Georgia Wisner, we've been able to look at the tra trajectory of the fraction of variants of uncertain significance by ancestry, and we see that that disparity is actually narrowing, though it hasn't disappeared. Um, I think that this is looking only at hereditary cancer variants. I think if we widen the scope to other types of genes, the gap will be much larger. But I think this is something that we should consider monitoring and looking at to see that we actually tackle this super important disparity problem. And finally, I want to loop back to the patient um, with the MSL2 variant. Um, I think that having a database like this can help us take a little bit more of a rigorous approach to the patient matching that I mentioned earlier. So some of you might have been thinking when I was presenting this case, the skeptics among you, and I'm, I count myself among you, what if this was true, true, unrelated, right? Of course, people who get whole exome sequencing at Vanderbilt, they're going to be really sick. They're going to have a lot of medical problems. So the fact that they had this variant and then they had a, the matching phenotypes could have just been coincidental. But if you have this data at the population level and you get a good, a decent method to, to do some high throughput phenotyping, you can answer this question very systematically, which is what we attempted post hoc. Um, so if you take the patients who had the MSL2 variant, starting with the proband um, and using human phenotype ontology terms that the UDN folks came up with in a separate exam, you'll find that among 18,000 patients, just using retrospective EHR data, the proband is number one in 18,000 people in terms of their phenotype risk score. So they match themselves very well. If you look at the other two gene matching individuals, you'll see they're ranked 35th and 38th. So they are way on the long tail of the distribution. This means that if you look at a population level, these two patients do in fact match the proband um, much more than you would expect by chance. And if you narrow this down to the over 500 patients who we found who've received whole exome sequencing, they're ranked first, first ninth, and, and tenth, respectively. Um, so anyways, I, I didn't have time to talk about some of the awesome research, I regret, um, that's being done on these clinical genetic variants that we're putting together, but um, I wanted to show some pictures. Here's Georgia Weiser and Chen Ji Zhang, who are doing a, a project in conjunction with eMERGE and some EHR data. That's really amazing. Doug Rutifer and Ted, Ted Morley are working on trying to find patients who are undiagnosed, you, training um, algorithms on this data. And I have my UDN friends up top and my wonderful advisor, Josh Peterson at the bottom. And I just wanna say that even though it's a total pain, I think that we should be trying to exploit this data to the nth degree because it'll help us figure out what we're gonna be able to do once we solve these problems tomorrow. And I just wanna thank you so much for your attention. Okay, Lisa, we have time for maybe one question. So Lisa, there was a, there is a couple comments which we'll say, but the question was, how do we scale these kinds of queries to EHRs outside of Vanderbilt? Could there be a fire enabled app that can send these queries nationally? I think that would be amazing. The first step is actually just to extract, if we wanted to take advantage of the last 20 years of data, we're gonna to have to find some process to extract that information from the EHR. And I suspect that that is going to be a per institution type problem. Early on in this process, I had ambitions of developing with a student I'm working with an algorithm that we could send to all of our friends who have EHR data to extract this information. But we have since been sort of overwhelmed by the, the difficulty of doing that, given how complicated the, the format is. Um, once that data is structured, I don't know, I'm not really a systems person thing, I, but I, I hope that my friends here who are systems type people start contemplating that because I do think it'd be very valuable, even just for the patient matching stuff, to have a sort of network like that um, in the same way that Matchmaker does, but powered by EHRs. Okay, we need to move on to Kevin. Thank you, Lisa. Um, sorry, good day, everybody. Lisa, fantastic job. Um, I feel like I should start this out by saying, hello, Newcastle. Um, I have some coals for you uh, because so many of the people who are hearing this and who've had a chance to present 
um, really have done so much of the work that leads up to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but I'm delighted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Vanderbilt and how it kind of relates to the strategic vision that NHGRI has already put out um, that relates to genome friendly connected care. So I think it's important to start out with, with where medicine is going. And if you look at the upper left of this slide, you can see, uh, I think, our new reality, which is the sudden acceptance of telemedicine as a very viable alternative. With telemedicine is likely going to be a real resurgence in our interest in digital health or consumer health informatics. To the, to the right of that, I show a picture of a program that we're going to spend a teeny bit more time discussing, which is the program that was developed by Dan Roden and Dan Masis and others called PREDICT, which is something that we've been doing at Vanderbilt, and that I think really was a harbinger of what you now see and emerge. Um, in the bottom left, we've talked quite a bit about this, but I think it's clear that a part of what medicine is now understanding is the role that not just genetics, but things like individual behavior and social and behavioral determinants play in terms of our risk of disease and our likelihood of successful treatment with the um, options that we have available to us. And then I think the fourth thing is the emergence of AI. Uh, we had a recent paper that came out in Clinical Translational Science talking about the fact that what we think about in precision medicine and the techniques that might be available to us through artificial intelligence can be brought together to help us to think about new ways to plan therapies, new ways to do risk prediction or diagnosis that are both genomic and non-genomic. And this kind of encapsulates the conversation that's going on right now in the field. The other key kind of preliminary components of this is that there are these enabling platforms. We've talked about FHIR a number of times, and I anticipated that we would even more, so I'm not going to. Uh, but there are two others, one of which is the 21st Century Cures Act, which really represents a sudden acceptance um, you know, in the federal government for the role that electronic health records and data, you know, a multi-trillion dollar industry, need to now play in helping to move the way we take care of patients forward. And if you haven't had a chance to read this, I think the key summary here is interoperability, data sharing, and information blocking, among other things. The other big thing is that, um, and I bring this up because it, it, it was one of those musings, I was watching the, um, the video from the Consumer Electronics Show. And one of the enabling platforms that we have to recognize now is that many of the technologies that are very, you know, um, science fiction of the 70s and 80s are actually commonplace at some point, at some place in our country or in our world right now. This is just one example of many automated robots, for example, here to provide people access to masks when they're going into public places. And so it, it reminds us that the, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed, which is a great quote by, by William Gibson. And that I think relates to both the talk that, that Mark started us off with, talking about clinical decision support and genomic standards that are here in certain places, the comments that Ken Kawamoto and others have already made, which is while they may be here if you're an Epic or Cerner site, they actually might not be here if you're an Allscripts or, Electro or um, ECW, EHR. And that whole idea, I think, is, is one of their big challenges of, of today. So at VUMC, one of our current capabilities, which is an unabashedly EPIC-based current capability now, is that we have a system that allows us to do relatively at scale, both prediction and um, pharmacogenomics, genome-informed um, prescribing. We have 14 medications that you can see on the slide here. We have a series of best practice advisors that have sort of followed the Jerry Osherhoff and other best practices for building an alert and a reminder. And depending on which study you've seen of ours, we get somewhere between 30 and 70% acceptance of these best practice advisors. But we also have patient access to this information via a genetic profile page in their patient portal. And we have a website called My Drug Genome that goes through the entire program that's available for patients to see. And we've done all of that with the hope that we, since 2010, could continue to scale an environment that supported what we've been talking about today. We have uh, tools allowing us to do browsing of the star alleles and mapping them to specific drug genome interactions. 
a term I co coined in about 2008 that managed to stick for some reason. And then if you look on the right here, you can see that we've relied on data from groups like CPIC and NHGRI funded work to develop not just the mapping of the star alleles, but also the actual words for adults and pediatrics and custom versions of this um, and research about literacy to help us make the best clinical recommendations that we can, all of which then feeds into a typical best practice advisor. So this is work that we've been doing, many, many other people are doing it, Cincinnati Children's, uh, many of our eMERGE sites, and a lot of those data have come out in papers as recently as a Jamia paper from this year or from 2019, talking about the extent that this is happening. So this is all work that a lot of people are doing. So the good news is that we have a lot in production and we're using the standards that are currently available to, to some extent. The bad news is the rest of the talk, which is the barriers that represent how we get to this vision that we have of combining both health system comfort with genome-informed care and patient-level comfort with genome-informed care. So that implies that we need to be able to um, deal with things like reimbursement, things like scaling technologies that may not be as comfortable for everybody, and um, also understanding the fact that not every patient seen at a place like Vanderbilt is gonna have all of their care either starting or ending there. So we got a group together this uh, last year to start looking at the workflow that needs to be supported for us to accomplish that vision. And uh, this is not yet published work, we're working on it, but I thought it would be really useful to share it to, for this group. Um, sorry, hope that doesn't happen again. So, the case just to drive this is a 19 year old woman evaluated in primary care after spontaneous pneumothorax with a heart murmur, the clinician suspects Marfan syndrome. So the typical clinician, if you go to the very left, will review the electronic health record and see the patient and update the electronic health record with the information that they have currently available. I think my slide might be automatically advancing. I apologize for that. Um, we then have to ask the question, to what extent is that information going to be triggering clinical decision support. The patient then had, or the clinician then may not be sure of whether or what to order and may want to order a test or may need to get a consult. That consult needs to be easy to access and orderable, which means there has to be work done in the electronic health record to support those orders. The consult occurs, the test is reviewed by genetic consult uh, counselors, and to do that, we have to make sure that the correct test is ordered consistently and easily. And that, by the way, if we're doing those studies internally, we have panels in-house. The results have to be returned, which means they have to be available in a consistent format, location, and computable. And in our case, that means we have to basically use our existing technologies, which are two systems that allow us to get the results sequenced and in the EHR. And then finally, any variants of unknown significant have to be was thought about, we call Lisa, where we do some other work. If the result is clear, we have to make sure that those data are easy to access for interpreting the results. And to do that, we probably have to expand our e-consult system that we've already described that would help people who don't know whether the VUS is significant um, or not. So if you look at this technical foundation and the workflow, and the look at the works on the bottom, it's clear that there's still an enormous amount of work that we would need to do even in a situation where we think our EHR and other systems are capable of doing it. There's also questions that we should anticipate. Which drug will be most effective in this patient? Should I be considering genetic testing? And if so, what test? And by the way, many of these questions will come from our patients as well as our providers. How do I interpret these test results? They don't have clinical meaning. What does indeterminate mean? The literature isn't specific to my patient. What have other patients like her at Vanderbilt experienced? Is there any clinical trial for my patient out there? What is the best way to treat my patient's tumor or other disease? So we recognize that to do this at scale, all of these questions have to be addressed and the infrastructure that we showed at the, on a previous slide has to be a part of that solution. And so the health system challenges that we recognize right from the beginning could kind of lump into four categories, interoperability and data flow, where we need computable data from the outside lab and we need to be able to do recontact as information changes. Provider knowledge, where we need to understand the nomenclature, star alleles, et cetera, 
and addressing any family concerns that might relate to these results. Information literacy, where we need consistent knowledge representation, especially to the point that Lisa just brought up, if some of the data that are being brought in from the outside world or from an external lab are actually not computable, and we are relying on either handwritten versions of that, which may have all sorts of interesting transcription and autocorrect problems, especially since people are dictating more and more, and they have to be understandable to the lay public. And then a return on investment for screening, which is a gigantic problem, where we need to have quality evaluation studies and payer and self-insured party support so that we can actually get the study, the tests done through whole exome or other arrays in advance of the patient needing that alert to be called and this clinical decision support to be fired. From a patient perspective, there's also daily living challenges. That includes equity, access to tailored care, uh, literacy, understanding the nomenclature and family concerns, fear and misinformation, which you see on the right, and then life integration, technology literacy, and recontact. Jim, am I out of time? Looks like I might be. Yes, you are. Thank you. Just real quickly, inequity we've talked about quite a bit. I won't go through it now, but there are major issues there. And gen the gen gen genetic discrimination fears, also a giant issue. And what we could automate, which could include some of the ways we deal with workforce shortage if we think about it. So in summary, this is the research that developed that is necessary now, which includes provider and patient literacy, expanding the systems that we have to help identify barriers of unknown significance, developing standards, return on investment, and then basically more genomic expertise available for both patients and everyone else. Uh, thank you. Great. Um, so we've had uh, three uh, amazing talks on, on very diverse uh, topics related to advanced technologies to support genomic medicine, very different perspectives. Um, and what I'd like to do, because we had a number of, of questions and comments that we didn't have time to get to, since we have a little bit of time now, what I'd like to start off with is actually going back and uh, having the, the speakers address some of those uh, questions and comments and, and we'll start from the from the last uh, talk. Um, so Kevin, uh, the, there was a comment about the, the impressive alert acceptance rate. I think you said it was like 70 percent uh, for your uh, for your system. Uh, did that change over time? And in other words, was was it 70% right off the bat, or did it take time for that acceptance rate to climb to that level? Yeah, what a great question. Um, so full disclosure, uh, and these are all published data, we started out with our, our first paper showing an acceptance rate of about 55%. We then started to do some additional work, and, and many of the reasons why people chose not to accept our original alerts, which were for clopidogrel primarily, had to do with the fact that they did not believe that they were really the authorized prescriber. In other words, this was a drug that although was, was being fired, the alert was being fired for one provider, their belief was that other providers should be responsible for this. After, as we got through education and some additional building of tools to allow pharmacy-based workflows and others, we were able to get the work, the, um, the change rate up to 70%. So while the alert wasn't always accepted, the, the recommendation was followed. Actually, over the last six years, it's going down. And one of the studies that we're now in the process of trying to understand is why is that? Our, our hypothesis is that there are many more indications for the prescribing of these drugs that's making it now not as clear what the equally efficacious alternative therapy should be. And therefore, people are not accepting those alerts. Um, we undoubtedly had a bit of a hit as we went, first went to Epic because we had to build the system differently. It now works exactly the same but that also I think affected some people um, and that's where we are. So one of our real, one of our requirements now is to get, get a tracking system in place so that we can actually understand that better. But thanks for bringing that up. And uh, another question that just came in for you is uh, to what extent is the general public weary of genetic testing due to things like potential for disability or life insurance discrimination? Well, I think if Janina was to talk about this, she would say, I think it depends on which part of the general public we're talking about, right? So if you are in the 
upper middle, upper class part of Tennessee, we're quite comfortable with the idea that more people now would like this than ever before. One of our beliefs is that if we go to patients who've had any previous adverse drug event, they're gonna likely be very excited about genomic testing. So that's something we're gonna explore in the next year. If you go to populations where the system is largely untrusting, and that's why I bring up GINA, and why there's so, it's so much important work to be done there, what you're gonna find is they don't understand it. And they're not completely sure what the collateral damage is of getting it. And it gets back to the point she was making, Janine was making, which is even if we do the test, people don't know why it's gonna benefit them. And one of the challenges of doing predictive genomics, so whole exome before the patient actually needs it, is they won't get results back when it's first done. There isn't a very clear trade-off until potentially a decade down the road or five or six years down the road. And so there's an enormous, enormous educational component to this that we have to begin and that I hope NHGR takes on. It's in the, it's in the vision and hopefully that's really something that we take on across the entire health system. And that includes the frontline registration staff, who in our place had been known to say things like, you don't really want to sign up for that, do you? And so I think we have to actually educate the whole place. Great. Um, Lisa, a question um, for you that we didn't have time to address. Um, are, are there more large databases that could be pulled into or linked into your EHR queries to help with the gene matching uh, or could these be connected to the places doing uh, a lot of clinical sequencing? Um, okay, thank you for that. The uh, one, one database that we do use regularly, and I didn't have time to get into the details, is just OMIM that's been annotated with HPO terms. Because if you, that you can then figure out what genes actually are related to breast cancer and then find people who have genetic results that are related to that and do some of the visualizations that I showed. But I think that the question is probably pertaining to other institutions that have both genotype and phenotype data. To my knowledge, and I might be naive here, I think a lot of the places that have the most genotype data, those like clinical sequencing labs are phenotype poor. So they're rich in genotypes and poor in phenotypes. So, but, I think that, you know, at least our experience at Vanderbilt, once we started looking into the medical record to try to see um, what kind of genetic testing results we could find, we were surprised by how much was already there. I have a feeling that if you looked at other large medical, um, you know, medical systems that they would have the same experience. The question is, is it worth going through the pain of extracting that information to make a, a resource? I think it is, um, but others may <laughs> disagree. <laughs> Well, a kind of a related question to that was, how do you scale the kinds of queries you talked about outside of Vanderbilt? Um, could you send queries? I mean, I, I would imagine your vision is you'd be able to send these queries out nationally or internationally um, and have meaningful results returned. I think a lot of work that's been done with patient matching with things like patient like me and things like that actually have, have addressed a lot of these problems of how to do scalable queries. The question is, do we have the data structured in the back end in the first place to, to support those queries? And right now, like I said, no. Um, one thing that I didn't delve into though, I think eventually the problem of getting structured machine readable genetic data linked to the EHR is gonna be solved in the near future, right? Um, and there is a fairly standard kind of nomenclature to with total precision say this is the, the variant that somebody has. I'm not sure that we'll ever get to a point where we can do that with the phenome, right? It's just too slippery. It's too, there's too many nuances to actually be in, with the same level of precision kind of pinpoint the phenome. Um, but something that we've worked on a lot, a lot of people at Vanderbilt and elsewhere, of course, is how do we extract accurate phenotypic information out of the EHR? And I think that, I think that so that's another barrier, um, but I think it's one that we may not have perfect solutions for right now, but I think there are ones that are ready that we could actually start experimenting with, with networking out. Carol, may I make two comments? Of course. Okay, first, thank you. Um, first, uh, without, I don't know what every vendor is doing, but I will tell you that I know that Epic has a plan to use Cosmos to sort of implement some of what Nigam Shaw and others have done in patients like me. Um, so perhaps at some point it would be very useful for NHGRI to bring together some sort of vendor panel to understand what they, how they are viewing this, um, to what extent are their information blocking and other strategies going to confound our ability to scale some of this work. Um, and that's just one point. Um, Lisa brought up the point about um, 
about unstructured data. And I have to respectfully challenge that assumption that we're getting closer because as long as we have things like direct to consumer testing, and as long as we don't have standards that are in that space, we will likely always have this fragmented, rich data source. Um, and, and I think that's going to be a problem until we actually really figure out how to address it. What's very clear is that variant information is lexically complex and semantically complex, which means really, really small changes in one character completely change how we interpret it. And therefore, OCR is very risky without a very significant um, quality assessment product around it to make sure that quality control, to make sure that there is, there's no possibility of a false positive being introduced. Great, thank you, Kevin. Um, Lisa, one, one last quick question for you, and then I have some questions for, for Gil, to go back to Gil, and then some panel-wide questions. So uh, Lisa, are you still turning to ICD-10 codes, or have you moved past that? That was one of the questions. Um, me personally, I'm dipping my toe back into NLP um, after a long, um, after I ran away screaming, realizing how hard it was to do that in the EHR. Um, I love billing codes. I, I think billing codes, if you want to, if you want to replicate a finding, you're saying we just need billing codes. People are like, okay, if you say we need you to run this NLP pipeline on all your notes, they say no, right? So the scalability, the ease of use, the fact that billing codes, usually when they're applied to the patient, it's at least, it can be interpreted sometimes incorrectly that that's something that's happening with the patient and not their aunt and not that it's something they're worried about, blah, blah, blah. Those are all wonderful properties. But of course, the medical record contains a lot more information than can be um, glean from billing codes. One thing that we've just started doing in the last month is we have a really amazing programmer um, who has done NLP work and a custom NLP pipeline on all of our notes. And so I'm going to work on integrating some of that into phenotype risk score and basically measure how much more can, how much more easily and how much with, with, you know, how much more certain can you be that people have a particular genetic diagnosis if you integrate the information that you get from NLP? I, I actually don't even really have a guess as to how valuable that is. I will say the pain of getting NLP out of notes means that you should, you should require that you get a pretty good significant um, bump in performance in order to go down that road, but I'm willing to try again. Great, thank you. Uh, Gil, I wanna pull you back in because there were a, a few questions for you um, as well. And then we, I have a few here that are good for the whole panel. So Gil, um, one of the questions is, wh what are the barriers to these networked ecosystems you talked about, sociological or technical or, or both? Right, right. So uh, there are a number of different ones that uh, we've seen. I think we've seen both the sociological and the technical, uh, but that the kind of the cultural, uh, you know, the, the sociological ones are kind of the the larger ones at this point. So a lot of the technical challenge, and this maybe goes to another question, but uh, you know, in terms of standards and so forth, you know, they've been developed. There's you know a little bit of fine tuning, perhaps here and there, but um, you know, I think it's more uh, a matter of that there are different types of organizations and they have different incentives for uh, their work. Um, so. Uh, for example, the genomic information is just sort of on the, the tail distribution of what the electronic medical record, you know, health record vendors are, are looking at. Um, there are a number of other priorities that they may have that, you know, may be kind of a, a ahead of it. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, you look at other, uh, you know, if you look at uh, different lab uh, vendors, you know, the same thing. It may be that only a few of the lab vendors really, genomics is kind of their main uh, their main area of, of, of uh, focus, uh, but um, there, I think there was, um, there's a sense that the the field potentially, you know, was changing rapidly, uh, which it was, um, and you know now things I think are a little more uh, stabilized. So I, I think it's really just a matter of time before uh, the different parties that have different incentives will see that when you look at it as an uh, as an overall network. Uh, there are a lot of different, um, the, the return on investment will be there um, if uh, in adopting uh, the, you know, the technologies that are already there. Great. Um, another uh, question that came uh, directly from your talk was, um, 
the social contract process is interesting for patients to specify preferences for care. Um, and is there a vision for how this could be coupled with clinical or patient decision support? Right, right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it can certainly uh, be integrated. I mean, the goal is for it to be integrated um, with that. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure if it was this question or another one was talking about um, you know, it, it can change over time, right? Uh, they're, they're smart contract and, and those are all true. And that's why uh, there are a number of different approaches to, to doing that. Uh, it, it should be, and the approach it should be user is one that allows for that to be updated, amendment, amended, just like, you know, you have uh, today, uh, you know, you may have a will, you can make a change. Uh, you have a uh, a bank account, you can decide to, to make a change in, in kind of uh, who gets to see your information if you want to share it with uh, one organization or another, you know, deposits and uh, to have automated deposits and things like that. So um, that's going to be the, the very nature of it. And so uh, who you share that with uh, should uh, reflect how you want to use. If you want to use for clinical decision support, then of course, you know, you would allow that, but others may just want it uh, to share with uh, their, their offspring or, or their family or, or, or part of it with themselves. So all of that, those are all things that can be uh, part of that. That's one of the nice things, a smart contract will be triggered based on different rules, different time periods, maybe that they wanna make changes at certain times in their life, or they may wanna sunset certain provisions later on as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a couple questions I think would be interesting to get the perspectives of all the panelists. And, and the first one um, is how much more work to do in developing genomic data structure standards for electronic health records. Um, there was optimism expressed about progress, especially in your talk, Gil, um, how far uh, to go next, I guess. And so Gil, maybe you can start and uh, Lisa and Kevin can jump in if they have some thoughts. Sure, I, and I, you know, I, it depends on, I think it may depend on how we interpret the question because there are a number of different standards you know, related to structuring, uh, unstructured information and so forth. Um, you know, so, you know, in some areas, I think, I mean, we're essentially, you know, there are uh, standards are there out there that uh, um, are being used, uh, you know, even in, in pre-production, in production. Um, and then there are others that, you know, they're in uh, potentially, you know, they, they, uh, they may contribute uh, to other to ways of, of capturing certain pieces of information, uh, and uh, they'll be they'll be ready with time. But I, I think for the one of the topics that we had concentrated on around you know delivering uh, clinical information or genomic information at the point of care, those standards are uh, there. Um, they're being used there, and um, with time, I think you'll see uh, you know they'll it'll go from kind of the larger some of the larger institutions to um, some of the others out there that are uh, wanting to get, get out there and, and to uh, you know, practice uh, genomic medicine. My only comment is that, well, first of all, I appreciate all the work that's getting put, to get put into getting these standards together because as you can tell, I think that this, the data that we can get from it is super valuable. But I just wanna, once again, in case it didn't come through, I think that the time to start developing methods around around what is going to be a coming wave of clinical genetic variant data that's going to be linked to the HR is right now, and that we have at, in, at our medical institutions the materials to start those studies. Um, I think that we've barely scratched the surface of the type of stuff that we're going to be able to do, and so we'll need time to develop those methods in anticipation of when all these smart people figure out all those problems. I guess I would go back to education again, and I, you know, I had to gloss over the inequity slide, but that's just such a big one. Um, I believe that the standards are far enough along that they can be tested and they can be iteratively refined, but we need an equally um, informed group of experts across the equity spectrum so that we can actually get a ver various systems and their various implementations at the table to make sure that the standards adequately represent the information that needs to be conveyed. So I guess what I would say is it's, it would be really helpful if NHGRI could begin to think about a research agenda as they are, that looks not just at the workforce equity, but also at implementation equity and the various 
the various levels of what we're going to have to create. There have been a number of there have been a couple of grants that have already started to address this, the Ignite grants among them. But I think that there's just a need to to. I mean, again, I think the chart chat brought it up, a need to make sure that some of the sites that don't have as much access to these larger electronic health records are also understood. So, so I guess I would ask for implementation science research from NHGRI. Great. Um, a question that came up that uh, is another one that I think um, you, you all would have an interesting perspective on has to do with um, sort of the longitudinal aspect, you know, how do, how do you track care from a pediatric setting to an adult setting to old age? Uh, how does a decision made at one point in life influence decisions and outcomes at later points in life? And, and how are these systems going to grapple with this, this kind of longitudinal tracking issue? I'll just start by saying, Brilliant observation. Uh, I'm a pediatrician, so I've been living in this world for a while, and I would say this is a space where we, we actively need to do research. We also need to understand the law, right? I mean, every pediatrician wants to ask the question, how did the things I've learned about the mother get transmitted into the baby's chart? We've been asking that question for decades, and it's an extremely hard problem. So what you've got in and what you just got into is not just the chart by chart interoperability, but the point that was being made earlier about if a paternal uncle has something, is that relevant? Yeah. You know, are people really going to fill out Mitri type tools so that they can have the data that we actually need to do the research? It's a big, it's a really big challenge. And I appreciate you bringing it up. Gil, Lisa, any comments from you? Mark? Yes, I'd, I'd like to, this is something I thought a lot about and it, it has to do with uh, some of the unique aspects of uh, genomic data. Um, the problem with electronic health record systems is that they are system focused, they're not patient focused. Um, and they serve the needs of systems, they serve the needs less so of clinicians, and they almost never serve the needs of patients. But genetic data, um, germline genetic data is something that has relevance for a patient across their entire lifespan. So I think one of the things we need to be thinking about is how do we move this information with the patient as they move through the healthcare delivery system. Because uh, even though we have a fair number of our patients that get cradle to grave care at Geisinger, uh, that is not the typical uh, situation that we experience in this country. And absent a national healthcare system or a national healthcare system informatics infrastructure, uh, this is a key problem. And so I, I've heard from several talks, the idea about more engagement with the patient and you know how do we, uh, make this more patient-centered. But I think that's really foundational for this particular problem because the data has to move with the patient. It's not system data, it's not provider data, it's patient data. Do you want us to tell you how we feel about that? Sure. <laughs> Bill should probably go first on this one. Uh, can, can you repeat the uh, the issue, like uh, the patient centricity of it, or uh, is there no? Yeah, how do we how do we move mm -hmm. the genomic data um, with the patient as mm -hmm. they uh, navigate through the entire healthcare ecosystem, as opposed to an individual system? Right, right. So there are a number of um, there are a number of ideas and approaches that are being taken on this now. Um, one is sort of this notion of almost like a uh, bank account. Uh, you know, so you, you can, you know, if you have uh, a currency, you, you know, in, in an account, you can, uh, you know, go to another bank, you can move it, you know, somewhere else. Um, and it is sort of, uh, you know, you have a credit card or something with you that links you to that piece of information that you can always carry with you. Um, that is kind of one approach. Um, I, I, another one is, um, you know, people have been using kind of these uh, systems, but they end up many times being a link to eventually linked to an institution, these sort of um, uh, genomic uh, archiving communication like systems, right? It's almost like a PAX like system, you know, where imaging data is. Um, and, uh, but we are seeing, starting to see trends. You may have heard of um, different electronic health record vendors starting to work with different cloud vendors and so forth. And so once you see some of that, um, 
once you see the fruition, some of that coming to fruition, like those are starting now, then uh, you'll start to see uh, potentially that data being stored in uh, in a cloud type of environment that could be accessible uh, in multiple different uh, locations. Uh, and that's why, you know, in, I, you know, I don't have the slides up now, but w w some of the key things that I mentioned for the future are around, um, you, you know, the authentication, privacy, you know, security, all those kind of issues, because uh, imagine, you know, if someone had a, I mean, you know, you're not going to carry around a USB kind of uh, uh, thumb drive. I mean, that was kind of the old way of maybe thinking about it. But uh, but essentially, it almost is like that in that it's uh, it, it's out there somewhere. And you have to make sure that if multiple people can access it, it is the people that you want uh, that can access it. Because if you can move that data, potentially someone else can move that data. Yeah, so coming back to the uh, purpose of the meeting, and, and I'd be interested to hear uh, Kevin and Lisa's perspective on this as well. What are the research questions around this type of patient-centered um, approach? You just raised, I think, one set of them, the authentication, uh, privacy, and security aspects of this. You know, that's a could be a very interesting um, uh, idea for research. What are, what are other research questions that might um, uh, be relevant for this? Uh, two that come to mind immediately are recontact and especially recontact in the absence of provider oversight. Um, something that we all talk about. We know that it's going to likely happen with all of us in some other environments. Um, and then, you know, we used to have this video that we made um, here that kind of was a vision video of a patient that was using the bar, re scanning a barcode at the grocery store and found that there was a over-the-counter med that they shouldn't take due to some patient characteristic. Let's just say it's genomics. I have absolutely no idea what knowledge would be necessary for a patient to be able to do that, to understand it, and to find the right alternative other than to barcode scan everything else on the aisle. So I, I think there's a whole conversation we have here about patient empowerment and um, what are some alternative models for you know, helping patients in a world where there may be information on their Apple Health Kit or other devices that could improve or work and their care or that of their loved ones. Thanks, yeah, to, I call that the Google map problem, which is you know, almost everybody can use a navigation on their software. We don't have to know the street level data, but there's some level of uh, ability to interpret what the app is telling us that allows us to get from point A to point B. I kind of see us needing that sort of thing in genomics. So uh, if I, uh, there has been a robust uh, chat and discussion going on and I, there's no way I'm going to be able the next two minutes capture it all. So uh, I hope that I've been able to uh, present um, most of the questions and points that have been um, posed by the audience members and thank you very much for all of your questions. Uh, thank you very much to the panelists for your, your really excellent presentations, very thought-provoking. Um, and Jim, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to wrap up. Okay, thanks. Um, I don't have any closing remarks. We'll just uh, break now and uh, I think we come back in 30 minutes. Is that that's the Great. Plan? So I'd like to thank all the participants and the co-moderators for session two. As Jim pointed out, there'll be a 30 minute break. So we'll be back at uh, 340. And relevant to Carol's con comment, uh, we are capturing, uh, I hope, <laughs> I think we are, all of the comments, um, uh, the things that are appearing in the question and answer. And so uh, after the meeting, even if we don't have a chance to uh, discuss it now, we might have opportunity tomorrow to bring some of these points back for additional discussion, but we'll certainly synthesize this after the meeting is over. And in the post-meeting materials, we'll be able to um, uh, put all this together. So please feel free to um, uh, enter information to the chat and Q&A. Uh, it, uh, it will be dealt with. So we will see you in 30 minutes.